Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Packet. Welcome back to the Packet Hacking Village. It is now the top of the hour, 1 p.m., and we have an old friend. He has spoken at Black Hat, then DEF CON, a number of occasions. Our old friend who will be talking about, an old friend who will be talking about PowerShell today, Nick Patel. Am I audible? Yes, I am. So, thank you everyone for coming to this session. Thank you very much for having me, guys. So, I'm going to talk about PowerShell for penetration testers. Uh, first of all, a couple of things about me. You know, even if they have introduced me, this uh, I always like to to increase my Twitter followers. So I am a hacker, I'm a trainer, speaker, penetration tester, etc. I maintain two open source toolkits, Kautilya and Nishan. Kautilya is useful for using human interface devices for penetration testing. I spoke about it yesterday. And the second one is Nishan, which uh, we will be using today. Uh, it helps you in using PowerShell for penetration testing. So this is my Twitter ID. Please do follow me. And that's my blog. I'm generally interested in, uh, in new ways of breaking into machines, obviously, when I'm authorized to do so. And I've spoken at a couple of conferences previously. So if, if you don't know, then we'll be talking about PowerShell and why do we as hackers, why will we use Windows and PowerShell as an attack platform? Uh, then we'll see how do we quickly, not, not really, in, I know will not take a long time for that. We'll see how we can execute codes, commands, and PowerShell scripts that is necessary so that you can follow on, on the live demonstrations. So they would be only live demonstrations. Even if I fail at them, there are no recorded demonstrations. And uh, then we'll pick a penetration testing scenario and try our work or try to work out that only using PowerShell. And then a couple of obligatory slides for defenses as well. So for Microsoft, PowerShell is something which was designed to automate things for system administrators. And whatever is useful or system for a system administrator is always useful for an attacker. So we use PowerShell because it is present on all modern Windows OS Post Windows Vista, it is installed by default on all Windows machines. It is really tightly integrated with, with .NET. In fact, it is based on the .NET framework. Uh, so .NET, WMI, Windows Registry, File System, Windows API, Certificate Stores, uh, and in fact, other machines on the network. It is always expandable with the use of the .NET framework. It is easy to learn although we are not going to learn it today. It also allows you to have less dependency to some extent on MSF, to a really small extent, and also on, on, on tools which create your Python or Ruby scripts to executables. No more executables are required on, uh, for your penetration test gigs anymore. So PowerShell contains two parts. If you notice, the title of the slides are in a format typical to PowerShell so that you can grab something more out of this. So PowerShell.exe is the console part of PowerShell. It is where all the action happens. You run commands, scripts, commandlets, everything here. It supports tab completion, context sensitive help, etc. And also the last thing, it provides various options and execution parameters which are really helpful to us. Okay, so there are two slides, sorry. Uh, next, uh, one commandlet, so PowerShell has commandless. One commandlet which I would like to emphasize upon is get help. Consider it like man pages for PowerShell. Everything, every built-in commandlet, all of the offensive PowerShell tools, defensive PowerShell tools, everyone tries to be compatible with this thing. You just type get help or its alias help and the script name and you'll get a nice list of uh, help topics available. 
This is the first place to go if you are trying to learn PowerShell. And if you are version 3 onwards, you may have to run update help before that. So, for example, let's run help about get help. Is it visible to the back? Is it visible? Yeah, thank you. So let's try get help. Get help. That is, we list help about the help system. Okay. So this is how you run PowerShell. Just okay. So you can just go to Start menu and type PowerShell, or you can just run it from the command prompt. So this is the help about get help. It comes with a couple of useful features or parameters, sorry, like this. If you say hyphen examples, it will list only the examples for that particular topic. Commandlets. Commandlets are heart and core of PowerShell. They are written CMD lab or spoken command lab. They are certainly the best features of PowerShell, task based, ready to use commands, built in. So that's just something which you will uh, you'll always dream of in on Windows. They follow a verb noun naming convention, that is uh, a verb dash a noun. For example, get dash help, get dash process, invoke dash something, things like this. And you have aliases for commandlets, for example, have you ever seen ls working on, on Windows, but it works because it is an alias for the get child item commandlet. You can define your own aliases as well. Uh, commandless always return objects, so you can do inert objects, uh, but if you want to edit them, that's not possible, but a lot of things could be done. Another commandlet which could be considered part of the help system and it is really useful to explore PowerShell is the get command commandlet. If you run it, if you have your window, uh, Windows machine right now with you, connect it to DEF CON open network, just type this. So there are a lot of commandlets on this machine and it depends on the version of PowerShell. I am running PowerShell version 3. So I have 298 built-in commandlets. For version 5, it's like, I, I think in thousands. It also depends on number of Microsoft things you have on your machine. Okay, so PowerShell.exe is the shell part and the ISU is the, the, the development part of the PowerShell or the scripting part. It is also a built-in thing which looks like this. It comes with the Windows Management Framework, so if you have PowerShell, you will have this as well. PowerShell scripts are saved a, with an extension of .ps1. Like many other development environments, ISC also supports context-sensitive help, type completion, selective running, etc. Execution policies. You will, if you if you work with Windows machines and you hack things, you will often uh, listen this from from our sysadmin friends or, or or even from our hacker friends that if there is an execution policy enabled, you may not be able to execute things. For example, so that the default execution policy on machines is either this or all sign. So now if I try to run a command, or sorry, a script, let's say, it says that because the execution of scripts has been disabled on this machine, you cannot execute this script. But if you run this, EP is a short for the execution policy. And now if I run this, the script has been loaded in my current PowerShell session and I can run it. So this is not something uh, which I did. It is by design by Microsoft because execution policy is not supposed to be 
a security control. In fact, I forgot to add a tweet by Jeffrey Snover, who is the designer of PowerShell. They, they add this deliberately to make it obvious that this is not a security control. You can always bypass this. It is meant to be bypassed. It is just there to stop users from accidentally executing scripts, uh, just like this thing. So if you double click a PowerShell script, it opens up in a notepad just to stop you from uh, executing it by mistake. In fact, there are so many ways that the nice guys at NetSP NetSPI have listed 15 ways of bypassing it. So go for it. The last thing for the theoretical part is basics of modules. So modules are, as in other languages, collection of, of functions or things which you can do and you may like to do in a single file or in a uh, in a single script. So you can always run these commands. You can run get module to list all the available modules on your machine. The one of interest for us right now is the import module commandlet. We will use this. We'll see this. Uh, see how we can use this to import modules. And after you have inserted a module, you can use this to list the modules imported, the commands exported by a module. So our penetration testing scenario is going to be this. We need to grab domain admin token or credentials or access somehow. Note that that domain admin is not a good target. You, if, if you do penetration testing professionally, you may like to discuss a goal with your client prior to the engagement. So uh, DA is really not a good goal, but for this demonstration, let's go for it. Uh, so back to our scenario. In our scenario, the goal is to get DA, but server-side attacks had been largely unsuccessful, which is generally the case nowadays if you are going from the outside. And Metasploit payloads are being detected by antivirus. Let's assume this. I know you guys are smart. There are so many ways of bypassing antivirus, but let's just assume this thing. So this is how we are going to do that. Uh, we will run a client-side attack, and one of the ways is to get access to a token with DA prefs. So that was the initial thing I planned, that red dotted arrow, but that's really very simple. So what we will have from client-side attack, we may have access to a SQL server. That SQL server may be running as a local admin of system or as a domain admin. That depends on the time uh, we have at hand and how patient you guys are with me. At the end, we will have shell access to uh, to the domain as a domain admin. That's the target. So client side attacks. PowerShell is the is, is really ideal tool for client side attacks. It is built in on the onto the machines. Antivirus and countermeasures generally don't care about it. And not go, not only it could be used to weaponize of a, a, a word file or something. It could also be used to generate them, as we'll see in a second. So we'll use client side experts from my tool and uh, use it for nasty. So this is how we'll use them. Let's try outward, which we executed just now. So outward, as the name suggests, it will create a. Well, let me go to the test room. First of all, let's import Nishang to the current session so that we need not run each script independently. Please ignore this warning. This has nothing to do with the maliciousness. I just didn't follow the naming convention, verb noun naming convention for some of the scripts. So let's use, let me clear that. Let's use outward. And then it asks for a payload. We will provide it a PowerShell payload. For now, let's just say this thing. We won't be able to see any output right now. And that is it. So now if you see here on the desktop of my machine, there is a, a word file called 
salary details talk doc you can always use whatever name you want so this is how we do it i'll show you to how to use payloads with this in a couple of minutes so this is basically how outward works you just need to provide a payload to it it will generate and so so the basic thing is there is an auto executable macro inside it please note that that macro is not password protected as far as i know there is no way of programmatically password protect a macro at least if you are using com object of word it doesn't expose that api or function at all that's that's at least what i know so that was the one way also you can provide a payload url to a powershell script so the target need to have access to this web server it will pull the script and execute it in memory so uh, we're just going through the different methods of uh, or attacks available with client side attack category in nishang so outward out excel we can also use out hta which generates a hta which is a microsoft which gets executed by a microsoft sign executable ms hta and out chm out shortcut which creates a compile html file and lnk file respectively so uh, we are going to use out chm because this is going to be our target and this one and i have I, so there is a small script running over there and there is a mail server running over there so if a chm attachment is sent to it it executes it automatically so that is why we are going to use chm and note that our target this machine it's really restrictive it is a windows 8 uh, it has incoming traffic only on port 25 outgoing only on 8443 and couple of them uh, only on port 53 for udp and i think icmp v4 that's it it's quite restrictive machine uh, let's generate okay prior to that we need a reverse shell access so let's go through the shell slides as well okay we assume that we can run successful client side attacks uh, on our target so now let's use couple of shells again from nishang uh, to to be able to get an interactive shell access on the target machine so we'll use this tcp reverse shell from nishang so it needs to have only these options that is the ip address to, to, to which it will connect and and on the port on which our listener would be listening so what we are going to do is uh, one thing which i forgot to show you is this powershell support powershell supports uh, encoded command parameters that is hyphen e so you can run scripts like powershell.exe hyphen e and the base64 encoded command so that thing is useful uh, because first of all if your script contains uh, so many double quotes and single quotes that problem is resolved also it gets executed in memory as well, as far as i know so that thing never touches disk so okay so let's get started i'm going to use uh this shell from nishang this is invoke powershell tcp19 let me open it in the ise so this is just a one line shell i'm i'm so so the second one is even smaller but that doesn't show the output back so i'm going to encode this and use this in fact i think i have already prepared one here so okay we are going to use this one which is the same thing So let's just quickly run invoke encode and the the tcp reverse shell and we want it to be executable with the hyphen e parameter of powershell so it is returned to this file so this is our and base64 encoded shell let me start a listener but not using linux because we are going to use only powershell 
let's use PowerCut, which is an awesome port of NetCat to PowerShell. Okay. Now, I'll just learn a listener on port 443. And now just first test our, our reverse shell, if it works or not, let's do it on local machine. So this is how we use it. So this is what we are going to run on our target. And yes, because it works, let's use it on the target. So here, we're going to use, okay, we're going to use out CHM because MS Office is not there on that machine. Now to use this one, you must have uh, HTML help workshop installed on, on your machine, that is the attacker's machine. So, so we have a compiled HTML help file on, on at this directory now. now. Now let's send an email to to a target. Let me see if this is proper. No, it's not. Oh, I forgot to start a listener, I think. Oh, it's there. So, let's see. Okay, so now we have a reverse shell from the target machine, which is a 112 of Windows 8 machine, and we are running as a domain user, which may or may not be a domain admin. So, uh, this mimics, obviously, it is not really this easy in an external gig, but if you do it for like 100 users, you'll get at least 30 or 40 connect backs. That's at least my, my dear clients uh, give, give to me. So uh, we can assume that now we have a foothold machine. In fact, we have. There's no need to assume it. So this uh, starts our post-exploitation phase. Obviously, I skipped a couple of starting phases. So now again, PowerShell is one of the best tools for post-exploitation for the same reasons which we discussed. It's built in, it's powerful, and Microsoft is going really big on PowerShell, so oh, this is going to be uh, one of the best things you will ever learn. Uh, not this session, PowerShell. So now we have an interactive PowerShell session on one of the machines. We can use various PowerShell tools for it. So let's use PowerView. These are from the guys from Beal. Uh, awesome tool. So it has a lot of commandlets or functions or scripts, whatever you want to call them, to enumerate a domain. But in, instead of going through everything, we'll just use this one. So invoke user hunter could be used to enumerate a domain to find all the machines where a domain admin is logged in. And if you use the parameter check access with it, it will check that if you have a local admin access to that machine as well, which is really sweet. So to, now there are two ways. Either I can use this reverse shell, or, okay, I'll use this, this one as well, never mind. Okay, what we are going to do now is we will pull PowerView or we will load PowerView into the memory of 
of this uh, PowerShell session uh, using this one liner. So, as you can see, right now we are using .NET to extend the capabilities of PowerShell. So, this those of you who who work with .NET or C sharp, .NET .Web Client is is a .NET class. And this is invoke expression. We are just going to. I mean, it is up to you. If you want, you can just upload this file there or and work that way, or we can use this in memory. So right now, this thing will not touch disk at all. It would be in the memory. So. As you can see, it has been downloaded. So now we must, we should have invoke user hunter there. Let's see if this is get help compatible. Oh yes, it is. So every every PowerShell tool you are going to use is the one uh, name there. The, the one the, which are really popular or at least are out there of beta things, they'll support this thing. So let's just copy this so that I do not have to type this out. I think I should run this with verbose because we will not see anything. Okay. Let me see if there is any verbose option with this. No effect of verbosity. Okay, so it you have to believe this that it, it looked for uh, for machines where a domain admin is logged in and it has local admin but it was unable to find that thing because there is uh, there is no such machine there are only these three machines running on my lab right now so uh, i demonstrated it just because i have been able to get into to, to get the domain admin access by using just this thing so let's move on with this thing so after having to fail, uh, having to get a domain admin with single command, let's try a couple of more things. So this is from the nice guys from NetSPI, this script. Uh, we will check if the current user, that is the lab user, of which, whose privileges we have the access to that machine, will see that if it has access to a database server. So again, we will we'll do the same thing. We will pull our script in the memory of this PowerShell session. And let's run this. Two sec. What's the name? Okay, let's check access. So So as conspired by me, <laughs> we got access to a couple of SQL servers. Okay. No access to only one one server on this machine, which is which appears to be a file server, and there is a okay there is an SQL server running on the local machine as well, but we are not interested in that, and in fact we have no access to that as well. So woo, we got access to a database. Uh, we, you can obviously use this script to to execute SQL queries and a lot of things there. Uh, but to execute commands or PowerShell scripts, I'm going to use this thing, which which is from my tool because I need to promote my tool as well. I don't want you guys to use other tools always. So I'm going to use this thing. Uh, note this parameter Windows authentication. That means we will use the the 
uh, the trust relationship we have with the database server, which we enumerated just now. So as a lab user, as this, uh, this domain user, which is called lab user, we have access to the database. And we are sysadmin, which, which may or may not be the case. I mean, it depends on the, on the role of that user in that organization. So now I will load execute command ms sql into, into memory of our reverse shell. So all of these are tab completion enabled. I mean, you need to you need not type everything, but since we are in a remote shell, this doesn't support tab completion. So I need to type out everything. So the server name was pfpt lab file, and Windows authentication. I don't think we need to provide anything else. And payload because we won't be able to so generally when you execute it it asks you if you want a powershell session or a plain old command prompt or an sql session but this that won't be visible here because we're already on a reverse shell so let's just try this first okay so as you can see that uh, we have access as a priv service user and this is on the remote machine. If you don't believe me, okay, sorry. Let me run just IP config. I think that dollar. Okay. So we are on on this machine two thirty dot two zero zero. So right now, if you see. Uh, this thing which we discussed earlier, uh, we are here. We had access to SQL Server or, or we are here. We can say that we are here. So, in fact, the truth is that uh, we are already, we already have domain admin because I was, uh, I don't know about the time. If, if you want, I can just restart that as a local system and do all that thing. So, if you notice, we were running as priv service, which is actually a domain admin in my lab. To check that, I'll just try. Okay. Let's try to run a command on the domain controller. So invoke command is a built-in PowerShell command line. So this is the domain controller. Let's run IP config there and see if it works. Okay, so we were, we are able to execute commands on the domain controller. So uh, that was one of the simpler cases, uh, but this is from my one of my actual penetration tests. I used it. I did that exactly the same way. Used created client side attacks, signed it to the clients. Of, of course, that that involved a lot of enumeration where I need to figure out the email addresses and the potential uh, potential targets for phishing and their roles in the in the organization of my client so uh, that was one of the cases now uh, i don't know if i'm going to try this because this is something really scary and takes a long time and but i don't do video demonstrations so i don't have a video as well but 
if we did not have access as a domain controller or, or our domain our SQL server was not running as a domain controller or, or as a system or a local service or not as a local service it, uh, if it was running at least as a system we can use this script from powersploit another really really awesome uh, collection of scripts for from for powershell uh, in fact the guy who wrote this just gave a talk uh, in defcon this year or over wmi so you can use invoke token manipulation okay invoke token manipulation is written by joe uh, who who is who's here as well so you can use it to manipulate or reuse or replay tokens of uh, different users on a machine. So imagine this, because we have system access on that machine, we would be able to enumerate or reuse all the tokens on that machine. And on that database server, there is a service running as a domain admin. So if you want, I can give it a try, but it takes time. I can show you the process. So there's something which is there to show at least. So it takes actually this long. I plan to do it, but when I tested it in my lab, it, it took really long, like half an hour to do that. There were so many fails. Uh, so do you want me to try that? Hands up. Oh, you guys are in minority, so no. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely show you. So if you're really interested, I'll definitely show you maybe after this. Or I don't want to ruin everyone else's mood that, okay, this was a Windows attack platform and didn't work. So let's just move on. But I do have time. Let me try this. Okay, so please be aware that there could be fails. There would be, there could be things which I can't figure out. So... What I'm going to do, I'm going to restart the SQL server service, which is currently running as a domain admin, to a local system. So I think I shall just close this thing. Okay, now if I run, so watch closely. If this works, because I don't know, Windows authentication may work or may not work because uh, of that change. If it works, okay, it says the target principal name is incorrect and cannot generate SSPI context. That's bad. Mm. Okay. So this is the first time I'm having a look at this thing, actually. So uh, we have to make a couple of assumptions. I will log into that Windows 8 machine and assume that I have RDP access to that. There's no other way around. Is that acceptable? Thanks. Okay, this is how our CHM execute after execution looks like. So this is something which is not really good. It shows the CHM file. But if you use outward or out Excel, uh, they are really clear, really clean. User doesn't see anything. So, okay, it has been executed for so many times. I think I'll just clean this. So there's a script on, on the target, it just saves the attachments to this directory and it gets executed, just to mimic a normal user. They always open every attachment. So, uh, let me just close this. And I think I do have everything here on this target. I don't know, I think I should not have this error. Wow, wow, it's not there, so it took some time. Wow, nice, yes. So as you can see that, we are system now. Demogods are happy with me. 
So uh, we are now running as a system. Now we'll go through a, a painful process of trying to get uh, domain admin access on that machine using this thing. So we must run PowerCat on attacker's machine, okay? On port 443. So here it goes. Okay, it's already there. So okay, so it's the complete thing. Yeah, we did code exec using client side attacks. Now here we have the execute command MS SQL running as well. Now if you see this command, what we are trying to do here is we will pull PowerCat in our existing reverse shell, add a relay because we do not have direct connection to the PFPT lab file. So we are sitting here. I do not have a network diagram. So if this is our attacker's machine and this is the client side, so the third bottle is PFPT lab. So I do not have direct access. I'll go there and from this machine I have to go there. So for that we need relays. PowerCat, because it's awesome, it has the capability of adding temporary relays as well. So let's use that. And this relay is it, as you can see, it forwards port 8000 of our Windows 8 machine to port 80 of our attacker's machine. So let's just quickly run this. I'm running it as a PowerShell job. That's what the start job command let do. Okay, looks good. Let's try. Okay, so the job has been started. That means it may be working. Now we have to need to start another listener. Okay. So I need to run it on this machine. This port and try it again. Okay, so the idea is to pull PowerCat here on the Windows 8 machine, that's our target, and add a relay. Okay, but that's not working right now, so, so let me check the check the firewall rules, see if I have the port allowed or not. It should not be. Oh, sorry. No, no, no Windows is turned on. So we have these four ports allowed on uh, on the outside, so they should be absolutely fine. Let me just try running this once more. I have to move move from this thing. I'm sorry. So maybe catch me after this. I mean, this works, trust me, but sorry, no video demonstrations, still. So, so the basic thing is this, if you have even, if, if you can use tokens, you can do it remotely. Uh, you can show it really ugly way if you want. Really ugly, I mean, really, really ugly. Do not try this at home, it's that ugly. I can just turn off the firewall on this machine so that I have a direct access. Okay, it's off. Wow. Because of some testing. Wow. That's that's great. So now we'll have a direct shell access to that machine, assuming that thing. So this is our database server. Uh, let's quickly run a listener on some port. Okay.
it's already in view, so I'll use this thing. So I have a listener running here. So I'll just, I've just changed the network so that we can quickly have a look at that thing. I always wish I can do this in real penetration tests. So now we have access to that machine. And now if we just put uh, invoke token manipulation there, which is this one. Okay, and now if we run it quickly. What? Okay, let me try it again. Let me check if it is there now. Okay, it's there, so let's run it. Let me just copy this. Oh. So let me try the lucky port. Okay, so this is my last attempt. Okay, let me just remove this thing. Okay, so in any case, you can you can use this to to enumerate them, uh, enumerate the tokens, and then reuse them. So the basic idea was that we'll create a reverse shell. Uh, with with the token of the domain admin and then we will have domain admin access but never mind we had the access already in some other scenario so but how we do how do we defense against these things log log powershell process log its command line um, and not only log that monitor and analyze the logs use powershell version 5 if if your environment really updates powershell there are so many improvements to the, to, to the security of PowerShell and the ability to analyze attacks. Another very important thing is to understand the flow and use of credentials and access in your environment. That's one of the more useful part. Uh, also, uh, make your users aware. Work on user awareness that if someone is sending, if you get an un unsolicited email, do not open attachments. I mean, that fails a lot, but keep trying, keep trying to make them aware. And this is because in my talk, system admins generally feel like that I'm targeting them. No, if a determined hacker or an attacker can get inside your machine, 
uh, determined system admin would be able to catch them. It's your environment, it's your backyard, you will be able to catch him. And uh, shout to these guys, they're all PowerShell hackers, many of them are here, so ask them on Twitter, meet them. If you're really into PowerShell hacking, you, you must meet these guys. And clothing remarks, a uh, bad guys are already using it. You will see so many malwares or bad guys using PowerShell. Use this and a code, this is my original code. PowerShell is not the feature of Windows penetration testing, it is the present. And at last, some shameless self-promotion. I do PowerShell training, so, so just check out the schedule. If you like it, attend it, and all the information you may like. Just catch me for some stickers if you want after the talk. So that's it.